the Soul Society arc does really good things for the character of Uryu Ishida, allowing him to showcase his wide variety of completely unique Quincy powers and helping him to really stand out from the rest of his friends. He absolutely breezes through Jirobo Ikenzaka near the start of the arc um, in a real showcase of what he's actually capable of. However, unknown to him, both he and Orohime Inoue are being stalked by the captain of the 12th division, Miyuri Kurotsuchi, the mad scientist. Now, once these two start fighting, some real personal feelings come out and Uryu's powers and abilities are pushed not only to their limit, but beyond it in what is probably the best fight for both of these characters in the series. Hey guys, thank you so much for the awesome reaction to the first video in the Bleach Battle Analysis series, Rukia vs. Asnot. Um, I know it has been about a month since the last one, but um, I have been busy. But I, I asked you guys to vote on which fight you'd like to see next, and the winner was the Uru vs. Miyuri fight from the Soul Society arc. So that's the one we're looking at today. However, much like the character analysis videos, the poll was really, really close. So the next battle we're gonna look at is Soifon Omaida and Hachi vs. Barragon, which is something I'm really looking forward to as well. Before we kick this video off however guys if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet make sure to click the button now um, join the community we're getting closer to 30,000 subs which is completely just cr that's a crazy number to me. Um, hit the like button if you enjoy the video it really helps with the exposure on the YouTube algorithm um, and also don't forget to hit the notification bell as well to stay up to date with everything I put out. Join the community as well by following me over on Twitter the name is coming up on the screen below and join our discord as well the link you'll find in the description. So the second battle analysis is going to Uryu versus Miyuri, which I'm really happy about. This is definitely one of my favourite battles in the Soul Society arc, and as I just said, as far as I'm concerned, this is the best fight for both Uryu and Miyuri in the series, although Miyuri versus Pernida in the Thousand Year Blood War is really good as well. I think the thing I like best about this fight for these two characters is it showcases them at their greatest. This is the most Miyuri Miyuri ever is. Like, he feels really evil and nasty and scheming in this battle, without a care in the world for anyone or anything but his research. And ever since this point in the story, Kubo kind of mellows him out a bit, which I guess is supposed to be his character development. But considering Miyuri is completely abhorrent in this battle, like he's a full-on villain, um, I'm almost surprised that Kubo went that route. Like, Miyuri and Uryu have kind of comedic interactions in the Waco Mundo arc, which always kind of felt a little bit weird. Um, I guess you could say that Uryu does get some kind of justice in this fight, at least. Um, but yeah, Miyuri is full-on evil, crazy scientist in this fight, which I, which I love. Um, and everything he does is drawn with such dynamism. Um, and everything he does looks so cool and interesting as well, which we'll obviously get into. And, and then there's Uryu, who is just on top form in this fight, as, as far as the Quincy go. When you think of Quincy, you probably think of this fight in some respects. Like, he is just... Everything he does is staked on the pride of the Quincy, um, and him using his holy form, let's steal at the end of the battle, is pretty much the best thing he does in the entire series. Um, it's like a Mugetsu way ahead of its time, you know? It's Mugetsu way before Ichigo even thinks about using it. Um, so yeah, from that perspective, this is a really, really cool fight. And it feels like there's a lot on the line, especially when you go back and reread it, as I did in preparation for this video, it feels like there's a lot being staked here. Uryu, his position feels almost inevitable when you go back and reread it. You, you know, you're waiting for the moment when he loses everything, but it's really satisfying and awesome all the same. This is also the first time in Bleach we ever see a Bankai. Like, that is really cool as well. Like, Miuri is the first character to use a Bankai. So when you think about it, we get a Bankai versus a Let's Steal, and like it's like crazy that this fight is actually awesome. This is pure Shinigami versus Quincy, way before the final arc. And in many respects, this fight does it better than a lot of the fights in the final arc, which is actually a bit of a shame thinking about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I love this fight. I think it's really, really cool. But one of the things I noticed when going back and reading it was there's actually not a lot of fighting, which I guess kind of makes sense for a Miyuri battle, but I feel like I always remembered there being a bit more. So this fight runs from chapter 119 all the way through to 126, and there aren't really any interruptions. There's a little bit of Ichigo and Yoroichi Bankai set up uh, around 119, 120. After that, it's straight fighting between Uryu and Miyuri, and there are no, there's no kind of uh, interruptions whatsoever, which I really, really like. This fight starts off in a fantastic way that really, really sets up Miyuri as a character. This is how you set up a battle. Like, I said last time that I really enjoyed the way Az's creepy Reiatsu felt like it was grabbing Rukia's arm. 
That's pretty cool, but it's not quite the same as this. So Uryu and Orihime have infiltrated the Shinigami. They've stolen a couple of uh, Shinigami robes and they're trying to make their way through the Seireite. However, they get approached by a member of the 11th Division who uh, I believe his name is Maki. Um, and he basically doesn't believe them. He thinks that they're, they are you know, potentially the invaders, but he that he gets attacked by a few members of the 12th division who are acting really, really nice towards Uryu and Orihime, basically saying, like, don't worry about these guys, you know, um, they're, they're, they're really rough and rough and ready, but you're all right now. Now, Uryu correctly assumes that something is not quite right here. Uryu and Orihime's um, lie is pretty flimsy. Like, they're pretty obviously not actually members of, the, of whatever division they're saying that they are. And yet the 12th division guys are apparently totally fine with them, uh, being there. All of a sudden, Uryu kind of detects that something's about to happen, he pushes Orihime out of the way, and the front guy just blows up. The front Shinigami just detonates in front of them, covering his friends in blood and guts. So, he's been turned into a bomb, and what's worse is none of them even realise this is actually happening. So, the, the other guys are like, what, what, what just happened? And then they try and turn and run back to Miyuri, and you get this really cool moment where Kubo... It properly emphasizes the horror these guys experienced as the last moments of their life. Because you actually get to see it from this Shinigami's perspective, which is really weird. And it's like no, the sort of thing that never happens in this series. But you get a first person view of this guy like running to Miyuri, being like, You you know what, you never said this was gonna happen to us, you know. And the guy has like hopes and dreams. And it's like really, really dark from Kubo. The guy's like, oh, you know, I joined this account. I joined the academy. I wanted to rise up and be a soul reaper. So why did... And you just see his arm like inflate before his eyes and he just blows up. Really, really dark. This is what I mean by Miyuri being full on Miyuri. At this, at the, it, it, he is the best he has ever been in this fight. And Kubo is willing to hammer that home. Um, and I think that opening really sets the tone for this battle because immediately before Uru has any idea about who Miyuri is, he is disgusted by him. Um, and Orihime as well has great moments in this fight. So both Uryu and Miyuri are the main combatants, but they're both supported by Orihime and Nemu, respectively. Um, and Orihime, you know, she has some good moments. She manages to block the explosion with her shield, which gets Miyuri's interest. But yeah, it's an awesome opening. And I just love the way Miyuri's like, no, no, the bombs are not supposed to come back to me. And he just blows them up. And Orihime's obviously cr crying because... Um, a big thing of her character is that friend or foe, she's sad when someone suffers. And Uryu's like, you know, you don't need to feel guilty, Orihime, that's the guy who should feel guilty. And Miyuri just spends this entire fight with a huge grin plastered on his face, which I absolutely love. Um, yeah, it's a really great way to kick things off. So Uryu immediately kicks things off by pointing his bow and arrow directly in Miyuri's face. And obviously Miyuri immediately deduces that he's a Quincy, but says he has absolutely no interest in him as he's already studied his species into oblivion. What he does have interest in, however, is Orihime and her special power to block his attacks. And as Orihime attempts to escape with the, uh, the guy called Maki, I think his name is, um, Miyuri tries to grab her. And what he does is he does that thing where he flings his arm out and it detaches at multiple points, and it just looks so dynamic. Um, I love the way Kub Kubo brings this back in the Thousand Year Blood War arc when he's fighting Pernida, but for some reason it doesn't have the same punch. Um, it just sort of like goes up and grabs on the ledge, but here he's like flings his whole arm at Orihime, like chases after her, and it's just like so creepy. Everything is so well drawn. Um, and Uryu blows the hand up in midair. He just shoots it and takes it out. And that's again, that's really cool because Uryu's obviously got incredible aim. Um, he's not to be taken lightly. Miyuri's not paying any attention to him at, at whatsoever at this point. Um, but Uryu manages to get his attention with that. So again, another really cool way to kick things off. But Miyuri says, you know, I'm not interested in you. Um, despite the fact that Uryu just shot his arm out of the sky. In many ways, Miyuri's fight with Pernida does feel like it's supposed to be a sequel or homage to this fight, because a lot of things that Miyuri does in this fight, he replicates later on, which is just not something he does in the Waco Mundo arc. Um, but in this fight, Kubo has an awful lot of fun making Miyuri as gross as possible. Like, he retracts the arm he destroyed by, like, squeezing it here, and, and like, a new one kind of comes out. Um, and it's, it's just really, really gross, uh, just the way, like, Kubo goes into serious detail about his arm, like, reforms in front of Uryu's eyes, um, but that sort of thing is just, it's really cool to see, because Kubo's always had a bit of a thing for, like, body horror, like, you see it in the Asnot fight as well, and if he can get away with gore, he will put it in, so the Miyuri stuff, clearly he was having a lot of fun drawing this character, and we know that Miyuri is basically his favourite character in the series, apart from Aizen, 
uh, and Kubo says that Miri is his favourite character to draw as well, and I think that's so obvious here. The fight begins in earnest with Uryu firing a couple of arrows at Miuri, and Miuri basically dodges them pretty much effortlessly um, and attempts to kind of get around Uryu. Now, again, like I said, there's not a huge amount of actual fighting in this in this fight itself. That's basically everything. Miuri is spending some time analysing Uryu, basically saying, you've been gathering Reishi from the buildings drawing during this fight. That's pretty amazing that a child like you can actually do that. And that's a running theme throughout this battle is Miuri's constant amazement at Uryu's skills and how he can keep pushing himself beyond where Miyuri thought he could reach. But Miyuri's clearly done messing around and he activates his Shikai Ashi Sogi Jizo. Again, it's done really, really cool. The whole, just the look of it is really creepy. It emits all this purple gas um, when Miyuri transforms it. One thing I always found to be kind of weird is that you never really see Ashi Sogi Jizo again after this in the manga. He never uses it in the Waco Mundo arc, as far as, I, as far as I can remember anyway. And he does use it briefly in the Thousand Year Blood War arc. He uses it to stab Hitsugaya when he's a zombie, and he uses it again to stab Kenpachi to paralyze them both, but you just don't really see the sword itself that much, which is kind of weird, but here it's on full view and it looks really awesome. Uryu readies himself for Miyuri's attack, but he's caught immediately off guard by the fact that Nemu jumps out of nowhere. She's not done anything up until this point. She jumps out of nowhere and just grapples him and doesn't let go, and Uryu's kind of like, what are you doing, what are you doing? You're about to get hit because Miyuri appears behind them to slash them both. And it's a really great moment because Ur Miri just cuts through both of them. Like Uryu gets hit, but Nemu gets hit as well. Um, and they both fall to the ground, sort of completely injured. Um, but Nemu lets go of Uryu once she gets sliced because obviously the pain of it, she can't actually keep it up. But Miri does not like that one bit and he just sort of smacks her in the face. And he's like, you know, I told you not to let go, even if, even if it killed you to do so. Um, and she's like, oh, you know, I'm really sorry. I'm really, and he's like, I didn't, I didn't expect anything out of you anyway. And you, and you have to, again... Going back to read this now, compare it to Miyuri in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, or even the Waco Mundo arc, and he's a completely different character. He's a completely different character. I, he, you could just never imagine him even hitting Nemu in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, let alone just being like smack around the face and be like, I told you not to let, not to let go. And so I guess that is character development. Like, uh, Miyuri is a monster in this, in this fight, um, especially to Nemu. He is completely just repugnant towards her, um, treating her like nothing more than a doll who he needs to use for fighting. Um, and, and then obviously later on in the story, his relationship with her does grow and she becomes more of a real daughter to him. He always, I feel like he always kind of just sees her as an achievement. Um, but yeah, in, in many ways, I, I do think the the character growth is definitely there for Miyuri. Um, and he's even there for Nemu as well, because Nemu obviously takes things into her own hands in the final arc, as opposed to just being told what to do by Miuri. Um, and their relationship doesn't change to a point where it's unrealistic, I don't think. I just think it's very stark going back and reading this now and being like, whoa, Miuri was actually like really, really nasty to, really nasty to Nemu. And it is, it's kind of weird to see. And that's what makes it also kind of weird that Uryu and him share such comedic moments, but... That doesn't really matter, but yeah, so he's not happy about the fact that Nemu let go of Uryu, but he says that from this point on, the fight will be as easy as breaking a baby's neck, because unknown to Uryu, he has been completely paralysed by Ashisoki Jizo's attack. As Miyuri torments Uryu with the fact that he can no longer move because he's been paralysed, Nemu dares to ask Miyuri for a Hoji Kuzai to heal herself because she's also been taken out of the fight. Again, Miyuri does not like that one bit, and he just starts stamping on her, and he's like, you know, how dare you ask me for that? How, you know, how dare you say that? You're worthless. Um, you know, you're useless. How, you know, you're, you're so much trouble. And he just starts, like, beating her up, and Uryu's like, stop it. You know, he tells him to stop, and Miyuri reveals to Uryu that actually Nemu is his creation. He can do what he likes with her. You know, it's, it doesn't matter what Uryu thinks. It doesn't matter what anyone thinks. Miyuri can do as he pleases with Nemu because she is essentially his daughter, so he owns her. And Miuri is like properly beating her up in this chapter, which is, like I said, pretty unpalatable to see, um, especially when you know how much he changes later. But anyway, Miuri then reveals to Uryu that like the true abilities of Ashisogi Jizo, which is to paralyze his opponent, but leave the pain receptors, you know, working perfectly fine, which obviously is completely uh, sadistic, perfect for Miuri. Kind of cool as well how Giselle calls him a sadist during their fight in the Thousand Year Blood War up because he, he is, um, you know, and, that, and that's exactly what his... Zanpakuto reflects, you know, which is cool because the Zanpakuto reflects the owner. So the fact that the Zanpakuto itself is so sadistic 
um, I thought was a really neat touch. We do now get the point in the fight where everything changes and uh, Uryu gets a new lease of life because of what happens next. So Miyuri kind of reveals to Uryu that, oh, you know, you go on and on about your Pride of the Quincy rubbish. I've heard it so many times before. You all say that just as you're about to die. And, Mi and Uryu's kind of like, what are you, what are you talking about? And, and Miyuri says, you know, I, I've, I've studied you all. You know, there's nothing more to learn from you. I've studied every single Quincy I've ever had. I've dissected them. I've torn them apart. I've... Every Quincy I've ever had screamed about their pride of the Quincy until the moment they died. Um, and I, I, got, I grew so sick of it, it just annoyed me. Um, but he basically Miyuri reveals that, yeah, he has spent years experimenting on Quincy's. You know, they, they, there are barely, barely any of them left in the world after the Shinigami purged them 200 years ago. And Miyuri has just spent time butchering them, chopping them up, you know, studying them for everything they can do, brutally murdering them. And this is a whole, this is a big theme of Miyuri's throughout his career in Bleach. Um, he's always trying to get people to be his research subjects. At the start of this fight, he mentions to Orihime how, you know, he's nice to women's subjects and he'll even let her have meals during the day. He might even let her have some place to wash. Um, you know, he's going to treat her like an animal, but, you know, she'll have some benefits to it. Um, and you kind of have to wonder how he treats some of the other ones. Probably pretty bad. Um, but he, this part of Miyuri does... It is a through line throughout the rest of the series. He is constantly asking people, you know, will you just come and be my research subject? Um, but it's, there's definitely less sinister, in the, again, in the final arc, because you're kind of more on his side, whereas here he is the full-on bad guy. Um, but yeah, he basically reveals to Uryu that, I, you know, the last guy I, I killed... On, it just kept on going about this student of his and it really annoyed me and it's pretty obvious at this point where it's going um, but Miyuri reveals that he's the one who has like dissected and just butchered Uryu's grandfather Soken. Now we knew already that Soken died trying to fight a lot of hollows but we find out here that Miyuri actually hired a bunch of Shinigami and told them to be late in saving the Quincy so that he would be killed and they could take his body back to the lab and that's really dark the, this bit of, is, is really cool because Kubo uses his art really well here and Miyuri drops a photo in front of Uryu and says that's all that was left of him and you don't get to see it explicitly but it's like a horror movie in what's like alluded to. You can see a faint reflection of the photo in Uryu's glasses and it's basically just his, fa his grandfather's head. Like there's blood all around it but it's just his head on the floor. Um, it's really, really well done. It's super ominous and it you know really sets the scene for what's coming next in the fight. And I, yeah, I, I really like it. I think it's really, really cool. Um, just Kubo, again, with his mastery of how to set a scene with imagery. It's it's really creepy. It has all these horror film vibes, the way it's shot, almost like a film. It's really, really cool. Miri thinks that Uryu is finished. He turns around and basically says, I told you I'm finished studying all of you. But suddenly, an explosion of Ryatsu goes off behind him and Uryu has managed to stand to his feet despite being paralysed and says that, uh, issued a Soken was my grandfather, and on the pride of the Quincy, I will kill you. And he basically really kind of throws down the gauntlet here for Miyuri, saying that, you know, you are not going to live past the end of this fight. And I know a lot of people are disappointed with the outcome of this fight because of this kind of proclamation, but regardless, it's really cool. Uh, and what happens next, like I said before at the start of this video, is just really great. Miyuri wonders exactly how Uryu is standing to his feet and then correctly surmises that he is using Ranso Tengai, which is a special Quincy ability that really only Quincy geniuses can use, where they basically take Reishi and they use it as like threads to hold their body up, almost like a puppet, and allow them to keep fighting even when their bodies are destroyed. Uh, Miyuri says that he's basically never seen a Quincy who could actually perform this technique and therefore Uryu must be some kind of genius. So it was always kind of weird to me, Ranso Tengai. I love the way it's used here, not so much in the Thousand Year Blood War because Kurge uses it, um, uh, he's the first Sternra to really see fight. He uses Ranso Tengai after he's been obliterated by Urahara and that was really cool. It's then never seen again. That really bugged me, that really, really bugged me. But Ranso Tengai here is awesome, um, and Uryu looks really, really cool. The, the, the panels that Kubo has drawn are amazing. Uryu ripping off the wrecked part of his clothes, this full page spread of him with Ranso Tengai threads coming off him. This is Uryu's proudest moment. Um, Uryu as a character, at least in terms of his fights, peaks here, no questions asked. No fight he has is as cool as this one, in my opinion. Um, it, it's kind of weird to think Uryu doesn't really get a fight, a proper fight, after the Waco Mundo arc. Um, but here, 
This fight is really, really cool, and this is Uryu at his best, showcasing the best of Quincy abilities. We then get a really nice flashback for Uryu, which includes, I believe anyway, the very first appearance of Ryuken, which is Uryu's father. And basically, Ryuken says, you know, you, you need to stop going to see that old man. You can't make a living from being a Quincy. Just stop it and, you know, allow them to die out. Obviously, at this point, we don't know that Ryuken himself is the last Quincy. Um, but it is really cool seeing him here anyway. And Uryu takes those concerns to his grandfather, Soken, and says, you know, why is my dad like this? Why doesn't he want the Quincy to survive? And Soken's like, well, you know, your dad is right. You know, you can't make a living from being a Quincy, but by being a Quincy, you know, you, you, you know, you, it's all about protecting people. And one day, your father wants to protect something. One day, you'll know what that is. And one day, you'll know what you want to protect. Um, and because of all this, because of this message that his grandfather is giving him, his grandfather reveals that he's entrusting Uryu with something called a Sanray Glove, um, which basically allows Uryu to unlock all of his Quincy powers at one time. And he should only use it once he knows exactly what he wants to protect. Now, Uryu says that he doesn't know that. He hasn't worked out what he wants to protect yet, but he does know what is utterly unforgivable. And you get this really cool shot of Miyuri just looking like completely demonic. Um, and Uryu resolves that he knows he has to defeat Miyuri no matter the cost. And this is really cool because it is Mugetsu, basically, but for Quincy's. And I just love the personal stakes here. I love the way Uryu, you know, is, is talking to his grandfather in his mind as he holds out the, the arm with the glove on it and he, he breaks the seal. And... It's just, again, it's really well drawn. It's so cinematic looking. It's it's really climactic. Um, Uryu, knowing full well that he'll probably lose his powers as a Quincy forever by doing this, but he thinks it's worth it. Which, in the way, makes the end of the fight, like I said before, a little disappointing. Because um, it's very much a Pyrrhic victory. Like He loses everything and doesn't even technically get what he wants. But So he breaks the seal on, on the glove... Reiatsu goes everywhere, like it just completely engulfs the battlefield, and you finally get to see Uryu's holy form, his Let's Steal. Um, and he looks really, really cool. This is back when Kubo's designs were still a little bit on the janky side, but like endearingly so. And I love the way Uryu looks. He looks really awesome. He's got like this cool new like collar and shoulder pads thing on. He's got the cool Quincy Zai Shen on his back. Um, he's like one wing of Reiatsu coming out of his back, which looks really, really awesome. Um, and he has this fancy new bow and everything. And this is basically his absolute ultimate form. Um, now, the Let's Steal and the Volston dish, which which is what we get in the final arc, they do kind of get cheapened a little bit by the Sturmritters because so many of them have such pathetic looking ones. Um, and they're summoned with no fanfare whatsoever. But some of the Volston dishes are still really cool. Uh, characters like Askin and Kurge have holy forms that remind me of Uryu's in some way. Um, but here, the holy form really does mean something. It, it, it costs you everything to use it, but he becomes so unbelievably powerful. He can not only fight on par with the Captain Level Shinigami, he can basically decimate him as well. I do love that Kubo went this really personal route with Uryu, because you have to remember at the start of the series, he was always kind of the cold, standoffish member of Ichigo's group. He was the one that was like, not really their friend, but also kind of their friend. And now... You get this really personal motivation for him to give up everything to defeat this character, and I love that. And Miyuri kind of watches in horror as Uryu's Reishi wing is just drawing in everything. Like, the buildings around him are crumbling, they're falling into him, making him stronger. And Miyuri says that he's no longer, you know, like, controlling these. He's no longer absorbing uh, Reishi particles. He has complete dominance over them. Which, if you remember from the Thousand Year Blood War, is basically the Slave Ray ability that Kurge uses to absorb Aeon. Um, I have to assume that Miyuri would be able to be absorbed by Uryu. I don't know, because it doesn't happen, but I, I don't know if maybe Miyuri's constitution is too strong as a captain, I don't know, or if Uryu would even be that way inclined to use an ability like that, because it's obviously considered, it's obviously supposed to be like an evil power slave ray, the way it's used in the Thousand Year Blood War. Um, but yeah, so Uryu is just destroying buildings to gain power, and it, it it's all looks really great. Uryu does this really cool thing where he just holds his hand out, and these wires, essentially, form from his wing and create an arrow in the palm of his hand. And you get the feeling, because of the way Kubo draws it with such grandiose nature, that every arrow is special here. That's the cool thing about this form. It's like every arrow means something. It takes It takes a decent amount of time just to get an arrow. 
and it looks it just every arrow is, is important every arrow could end the fight and I think that is, that is so cool and Uryu fires one off at Miyuri and Miyuri manages to dodge it but the moment he does Uryu is above him and he shoots another one and takes him down and it, it's actually very similar I noticed to the start of this fight which I think is the point Uryu does basically the exact same move he fires one at Miyuri Miyuri dodges it Uryu is then above him and he fires at him again. The difference here is that where Miri dodged it last time, this time he gets completely erect by it. Um, and it really showcases how the speed of the arrows has now improved. The irony being, of course, if Miri had actually given Nemu the antidote like she requested um, to be able to move again, she might have been able to help him out here. Although I still think they probably would have struggled. Now, Miyuri gets humbled pretty hard at this point in the fight, and you really get to see his ego take a serious beating, which is really nice and cathartic to see. But Uryu basically says, you know, if you leave now and never come back, I will spare your life. Um, but if you don't, I'll hit you with an arrow with more force than it had last time. And you get to see what Miyuri looks like as the smoke clears. He's kind of like lost his entire arm. All of the, the side of his face is wrecked, and he's just like, don't you get cocky with me? And he like screams at him because he's like losing his composure. Um, it's one of those situations, you get quite a lot of these in Bleach, um, it, it is a bit of a villainous breakdown, but basically things aren't going the way Miuri wants them to, so he freaks out about it, and it, it is really cathartic to see. Miuri then activates his Bankai, the first one we ever see in the series, which is a really cool moment as well. Um, it's actually pretty iconic, I think, the way he brings his sword up to his eye and he's like, Bankai, and then like the, basically the place just kind of gets covered in purple smoke and poison. You get, again, Kubo playing with the horror themes with Miyuri. You get this really cool shot of Uryu, and there's, like, shadows on him as this monstrous thing is, like, being built. It's, like, bubbling and stuff like that. And you get to see Konjiki Ashisogi Jizo, and it's this massive, monstrous, like, purple baby thing that almost looks like a mini Buddha statue or something. It has a big ring around its head with bells hanging off it. and the, But the body is, like, a monstrous kind of, like, slug or a caterpillar or something. It's awesome. The design is really, really cool. And this is the sort of thing that really helped Bleach stand out back in the day. The, the Just the designs of the Bankai and the Zanpak Toe, each one was so individual and suited its captain, uh, or just the character who was using it incredibly well. Um, every single one was so unique looking. And I just think the, the variety of powers on show and how well they were designed was a real boon for the series on the whole. And this is basically it for the fight. They come down to one final clash. Miyuri's Bankai spews blades out of its chest for some reason, but it looks awesome when it does so, and he prepares to charge at Uryu. Uryu stands there completely nonplussed by the whole situation, draws another arrow, and prepares to fire at this oncoming monstrosity. There's an incredible panel, which I didn't even remember until I went back to, to read this again, because it's quite a small panel of Uryu in his let's steel facing down this Bankai, and it's like, that is so cool, because that is the epitome of everything in this fight, but also of one of the big themes of Bleach, that is a fully powered Shinigami versus a fully powered Quincy. And the, the panel is like, deceptively small for considering the subject matter, but it looks fantastic. So Miyuri charges and Uryu fires, and I love that there's just this huge explosion, but Kubo wastes no time next chapter showing you exactly what the damage is, and Miyuri has essentially a hole here, like his entire his entire torso is basically gone. Um, this arrow has gone straight through him, pulverized his Bankai, bifurcated it straight down the middle, um, which actually when you think about it, it's kind of weird. So it's like the first time you ever see a Bankai, it's one-shotted. <laughs> the first time you ever see a Bankai in the series is taken out in one hit, so yeah, but it's, what's important is the dynamism on show how incredible this whole scene looks. I think anyway, I, I just love the way it's the way it's drawn, the way it's played out. Um, Miyuri's like complete and utter just gobsmacked face at the fact that he's like barely able to stand. Um, and his Bankai is just a smoking ruin in front of him. Uryu himself is also pretty wounded. I think it's a combination of being hit by uh, Ashisogi Jizo's poison, but also I'm pretty sure that final arrow he fired has just like wrecked his, his arm. He's like covered in blood and stuff. Um, but Miyuri makes his escape. He does not die. Um, despite being seriously wounded everywhere, he rams his sword into his throat and for some reason it pops him like a balloon and he, he just, this, this green liquid just goes everywhere and he turns turns into this fluid and escapes pretty much like through a drain. <laughs> um, it's really, really weird and you never see it again, I guess because Miri's not necessarily in that kind of situation again, but it's like the ultimate contingency, like the fact that he it basically means he can't die. Um, and you get this really cool voiceover from him where he's like, oh, you know, you did well, Quincy, but you're going to die from the poison and I will live on, I will reform, so I'm the winner in the end. And, and Miri escapes 
his pride in tatters. Like, he's definitely been humbled a lot, um, but he still thinks he's come out on top. But it is cool seeing him seriously wounded, and then he has to make his retreat. I'd say that's pretty embarrassing for him. Um, so Uryu does kind of get a moral victory here. He, You could say he gets one up on Miuri in that sense, um, but he is going to die... If, he, if he's not able to sort this poison out. Miuri seems to forget about Nemu, however, and she is on the ground, uh, unaffected by the poison because her blood is the same as Miuri's, and she gives Uryu the antidote to the poison, which is found underneath her vice captain's badge. Um, and they have a really nice moment to end the fight on. The fight has been so destructive up until this point, so full of vitriol and evil, that it's really nice to actually kind of end it a bit more downbeat with a nicer character, because Nemu is clearly nothing like her father. Um, and she heals Uryu, and basically she says, you know, thank you for sparing him. And Uryu's kind of like, I don't understand. You know, I didn't mean to spare him, I kind of missed. And he says, you know, isn't it better if someone like him doesn't exist? Um, and, you know, Nemu's kind of like, I, I, I don't know. Um, she, ba she basically says that she doesn't know, but, but thank you for sparing him regardless. And it is a really nice, it is a nice moment because Nemu shows a tenderness that you don't necessarily associate with the 12th Division. Um, and it is nice that she allows Uryu to basically walk free. Like the two of them part on a sort of amicable basis, um, which you, I kind of thought was going to formulate some kind of relationship for them in the future. They do talk again in the wake of Mundo arc, but obviously Uryu goes his own path in the final arc and makes it difficult to have a relationship with anyone. So it is nice this moment at the end of the fight. Um, I do like it. But that's pretty much it for Uryu versus Miyuri. As Uryu walks away, his Ranso Tengai starts to fade and he's instantly one shot by Kaname Tozen, who appears out of nowhere and does a really cool move where the whole like page goes black. That's awesome, but that's pretty much it for this battle, and like I said, I really, really enjoyed it. I thought it was awesome. I thought it was really, really well done. It's definitely Uryu's best fight, no question. He looks really cool. He is emblematic of everything the Quincy stand for in this battle, um, and Miyuri is just a monster. Like, Miyuri is the most evil face of the Shinigami here, because the Shinigami aren't technically villains. Um, but Mayuri definitely is in this fight, and I, and I really, really like that. But that's pretty much it, guys, for this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below what you think of Uryu versus Mayuri. Do you enjoy the fight? Is it your favourite Uryu fight, and is it your favourite Mayuri fight? Mayuri definitely has at least one that could contest it, I think. But as far as I'm concerned, this is the best showing for both of these guys, showing the true power of both Shinigami and Quincy, good and evil. And it is one of the best fights in the Soul Society arc. Um, pretty much no questions asked. So I hope you enjoyed guys and I'll see you next time. See you then.